Welcome to Unsuitable on Ray Radio, the award-winning financial services and business advisory podcast that challenges your old-school business practices and the traditional business suit culture. Our guests are industry professionals and experts who will challenge you to think beyond the suit and tie while offering you meaningful modern solutions to help you enhance your company's growth. I'm your host, Dave Kane. Is your company at risk? Would you know if it was? If an issue did arise, would the internal control procedures you have in place be enough to identify and fix the issue, or would you be left scratching your head unsure of how to proceed? Have no fear. Zach Morris, a principal and director of Ray's Government Services Team, is here to talk about internal controls. Zach's going to talk to us about why something as simple as implementing internal controls can save business owners a lot of sleepless nights and maybe even the business itself. Welcome to Unsuitable, Zach. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave. And this is your first time on the on the show. And yes, sir. We always like first time visitors. And uh, before we uh, get into the topic of internal control, I was looking at your uh, your bio and uh, your 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 leadership um, presentation and involvement in the community is uh, second to none. I I congratulate you on. Uh, on your leadership positions in your community. Oh, thank you. And also within Ray and Associates, job well done. No, oh, thank you. You know, whether it's uh, treasurer of this, uh, sports activities, uh, you name it, you're you're involved. I try to stay involved. So I try to you, live the Ray way. And you do. And certainly, as you look uh, at your bio on on, uh, on the RayNet, uh, I certainly see that you're heavily involved uh, with family activities. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you have a great uh, work-life balance and, and work through some uh, family uh, activities as well. We try. You know, I do want to talk to you a little bit about, about your family and, and things you do around the house. I understand you're relatively domesticated around the house. I understand you're pretty good at changing diapers. Is you know, that pretty I, good? I have been known to change a few. Yeah. Um, my wife would probably say it's not enough, but yeah. uh, what, uh, I try to pull my weight. What kind of housework uh, do you help with around the house? You uh, you run the vacuum cleaner. You know, do windows? What do you? What? How do you help out? It it depends on the day, really, and and the task at hand. Sometimes I'm volunteered to uh, um, do different things around the house, and I try to comply, just like I do at work. So, are, are you in charge of cleaning the bathrooms at home? You know, occasionally. Occasionally. Occasionally, yes. So you do it all. Uh, sometimes. So. Great. Uh, but I, I don't want this to be aired because if this happens, my wife's going to expect more from this. Well, I'm probably, I'm uh, probably inflating my I, contribution to the household a little bit, I, so uh, <laughs> thanks for that. You're in charge of grilling, I suspect. Yeah, that, that, that I can do. <laughs> that I can do. So uh, anyway, we want to talk about uh, internal control. It, um, uh, it, it's hot and heavy these days, yeah. and certainly where, uh, where you're involved in uh, government entities. Uh, you're always looking at internal controls. You know, let's start with, as we, we, we talked a few minutes ago about some stories you had about weaknesses in internal control or maybe some theft mm-hmm. stories. Can you share a few? Sure. I, you know, I think there, there's one, one large theft that comes to mind that maybe some of the, the um, listeners will have heard, uh, a lady by the name of Rita Cronwell in Dixon, Illinois, <clears throat> um, over the course of a number of years, stole about $53 million from her employer, um, which was the city of Dixon. She was the comptroller there. And um, to think about the, the size of the theft, and when you're looking at a, a city with an annual budget of about $10 million, um, so over a number of years, she was able to steal $53 million. And, um, and really some of the things that we'll end up talking about today could have potentially prevented that or... I won't say prevent, but maybe could have uh, stopped it sooner. Sure, um, and, sure. And avoided reaching reaching that point. You know, and that's a and that's a good example. And and that's a large organization, a larger mm-hmm. organization. Think about some of the smaller organizations, whether you're a government entity, not for profit entity, or for profit entity. And you know, and and that's a great point because you know you you look at the size of the organization, and sometimes some of the the smaller. Um, closely held businesses, I could see having some more of an issue in the internal control uh, arena just because of the the lack of people that they have. And you have people wearing multiple hats. There might not be appropriate segregation of duties. Um, There might not be proper training for the the people that are are carrying on those functions. And and some of that could lead to error or, I mean, uh, could be fraud. 
How do you create an appropriate environment of internal controls? And that's a high-level discussion, not a very popular discussion, but but it needs to be had. And, yeah. And how do you create that environment? You know, it, it really is a, it starts with the tone at the top. You know, you, you hear that phrase um, a lot, especially when it when it pertains to internal controls. And you're looking for leaders, uh, department managers, um, <laughs> various people within the organization who uh, will set that tone and really hold people in the organization accountable for their duties and following policies and, and whatever might be appropriate for that organization. You know, the tone at the top, and, and we hear that a lot, but if the, if the tone at the top, if they're not paying attention to an internal controls or bypassing internal controls, then the, the organization's wide open. It, and if you look at many frauds, many of those happen just based on the fact that there is opportunity to to uh, to take or steal or not safeguard an asset properly or to misappropriate, however it may be, just based on the fact that nobody's looking. Right, and and again, the example you you used was a government entity that was theft of taxpayer money. Correct, yeah, taxpayer and dollars. Where you know within within that organization itself, you were looking at firefighters being laid off because of budget cuts. You were looking at. Uh, Roads who couldn't be fixed that couldn't be fixed because they didn't have the money to invest in the infrastructure. While this lady was uh, um, investing in in horses and farms and different things of that nature, she had a really nice RV I hear. So um, just and everybody assumed it was family money. There wasn't there weren't a lot of people that asked questions. They there was just everybody trusted her, and you know and that's the the first failure that you find in an internal control is you trust. You trust. How was that fraud exposed? Do you recall? It, really, it had happened. She had taken some time off, and she was on vacation, and she had created some. She had opened a bank account under the city's name with an out-of-state bank, and when you when you looked at how that was working, it, she created like a reserve fund, and so she would put money in that reserve fund every month, and when she was on vacation some of those bank statements come in and they didn't look right and one of the other people in the department took them to the mayor and then they started investigating and that's really didn't smell right didn't it. look Just right didn't smell right so you use the word trust uh, certainly trust is is part of internal control but it can't be the only piece oh absolutely not um, you know it's the really your first line of defense is you know you, you want to respect everyone, trust no one. I mean, especially if it comes to your money uh, as a business owner or a, if you're trying to protect uh, donations from a private, from an organiz to an organization from an individual or if they're public tax dollars. And so you want to trust the people you work with, but you have to make sure that you have appropriate lines in place for them to not only safeguard that money, but then to protect the people who are handling that money as well. You know, as the director of Ray's government services team, just give me a feel. How many audits would you and your team oversee in a year? Uh, from an audit per opinion pers perspective, we issue probably 150 audit opinions at a minimum um, on an annual basis. That's a pretty significant amount of audit uh, reports and audit tests and internal control systems. There aren't two that are the same, are there? Not really. It's all, you know, it's you have the, the framework to where it's all built from, but from each organization, it really boils down to what works best for them and, and how they have developed procedures to, to safeguard their processes and to um, follow their policies. You know, again, uh, what we're talking about here are, are, are situations that, regard, like I said earlier, it doesn't matter whether it's a school district, a city, a county, a manufacturer, a retail, a booster club, uh, mm -hmm. all all of the above are exposed. It, it's it's interesting because you, you look at you, you name through all of those um, those types of organizations and the ones that uh, that I would worry the most about if I were to do any type of review would be the booster clubs, would be the the PTOs and and those organizations that have volunteers. And because of, when you when you when you look at a volunteer organization, a lot of times there isn't structure. And that there are processes to guide those people, and you know we talk again about opportunity. And so if they, those people have outside pressures to 
um, to take that money or um, if the opportunity presents itself, they, they might try it. And if they get away with it the first time, then they're, you know, it's one of those things that are going to go back to the well again. Sure. Let's go back to something you started the podcast in. This is your, uh, your grilling talents. Are you a charcoal or gas grill smoker? Where, where are you? Where are all you the at? above. All the above. All the above. What's your favorite thing to do in the smoker? Uh, I, I'm a big fan of uh, doing rib roast, prime rib. How long you? Uh, how long you leave that in the smoker? Yeah, you, you know, you, you don't rush it. You, <laughs> you put the thermometer in, and when it hits 132 degrees, and you turn that heat up to give it a little bit of a crust, and when it hits 135, you pull it off. Yeah. And it's just one of those things. Don't rush it. What's uh, what's your beverage of choice while that smoker's going on? Mm, probably an ice cold Keystone Light. I have to say. <laughs> I see you stepped up your game over the yeah, years. Yeah, you, know, you know it is what it is. Yeah. And, you know, I, so you know, I am, I, a Holmes, I am a Holmes County guy, so I will always drink my Keystone. And Light. proud of it. That's right. So, you know, as 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 I've read some of uh, your group's uh, white papers and and heard you speak and, and your group speak and not only at firm functions but around the state of Ohio, you constantly use the term risk assessment. Mm -hmm. What is risk assessment? You know, really from the, the risk assessment perspective, what you, what you look at there is what type of activities that, that management might be performing to determine where areas of the business they might be subject to uh, error or fraud or um, where the safeguards might not be in place. Um, you know, I, I always like to use the example from a risk assessment perspective is anytime you would have in any department within any type of organization where there is cash exchanged, that um, would inherently be a higher risk than that where there might be a wire transfer. So whether it's cash, maybe gold bars? Yeah, what, whatever it may risk. be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we probably have a lot of a lot of clients that we work with deal in gold, bar, gold bars, so uh, I'd like to get involved in one of those. Well, you know, you be in this business long enough, you just might have an hey, opportunity. You, you know, it is what it is. I so, love the opportunity, yeah. So, so go back to this risk assessment. If, um, if you're in an engagement, your team's in engagement, and it just doesn't feel right, doesn't smell right, does something bug you, what's the next step? You know, sometimes those are... Those are the uh, the crucial conversations that, that we talk about and, and ways to have conversations with management or people in the department that, uh, that might have some knowledge of the process, really just to try to understand. And some, sometimes there, there could be some things that might not smell right, but it, might not, it could potentially be because you don't have a proper understanding of the process. And so we, we try not to assume. Um, and so, but, but it's interesting because you start to interview some of these people, um, and that's where the interview skills come into play because um, we have some folks that are very good at, in, in, at that skill set of interviewing, and you can see the, the sweat beads start to come on to people, or, they're, or they, they might just not have any emotion at all. And so, you know, depending on how the reaction is, is you, you might go to you know, their manager or, or something to something in, in that general direction, just to really try to uncover what it is you're looking at. Okay, I, I've just engaged uh, your team to perform a financial audit of my records. Can I expect you to find fraud? <clears throat> no. Well, you know, the, Why not? I'm, I, you know, I saw your fee structure. You, my God, yeah, you got yeah. you got to find fraud. That, that sounds. You guys about, have been here for like three weeks. What that sounds about at? right. What are you looking at? You know, the the audit process is is not designed to detect fraud. Um, you know, if there were something that were to be discovered during the audit process, obviously we have the responsibility to communicate that. But when you're looking at, at audit methodology and sampling processes and the the I would say the rate at which some frauds might be detected, and if you were looking at some of the fraud reports issued annually, many of those detections don't come from the audit process. You know, most of them actually come from either someone in the organization or some other um, connection to those people providing tip or um, indicating they think there might be some type of wrongdoing. You know, I think a lot of our listeners would be surprised to hear that the typical audit is not designed to detect fraud. 
And I think a lot of a lot of times people go out and hire auditors thinking they're going to find fraud. Yeah, I, I I think that would be a if with the, without an understanding of the audit process and the standards that that could be a misconception that is out there. You know, it's really that the job of the audit is to determine that the financial statements are fairly presented. And so it's looking at the processes around those statements and how that financial data is, is rolls up into that financial statement. But as part of the financial audit, you will, or I guess will you, review the internal control process? Absolutely, um, especially in, in the world that, uh, that I live in specifically with with government auditing standards is is reviewing that and reporting on that internal control process. And in entities that receive federal dollars, it's the internal controls over com maintaining compliance with those grant agreements and contracts. So as, as you go and you assess the internal controls and you do find weaknesses, I think there's a discussion, like you said, a crucial conversation with management that, hey, with weak contr internal controls, you're wide open. It, you know, it, it is. And and not only do you need to have those discussions, but then when, when you look at the audit process, you go back to that risk assessment, and, you know, that, that creates risk. And because there is risk there that there could be error, um, or you know, I hate to jump right to fraud, but error or fraud, then that changes how you address that, that appropriate area. But that's your training. That's, that, that's, 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 that's what you're designed to do. That's, that's, that's what it is. That's what we're supposed to do. You know, we talked about creating the appropriate environment for internal controls, and that's a tone at the top, and certainly you, you uh, enlighten us on risk assessment. Let's talk about staff training and monitoring in the area of internal controls. Where do you start with, with training and staff training of internal controls? You know, I'm, I'm really gr I'm glad you bring that point up because it's just like anything else. You can, you can create the procedure. You can design the policy. You, you can hire good people, but if you don't appropriately train them, hold them accountable, follow up, none of it's really any good. <clears throat> so when you're looking from that perspective and, and that staff training, it's, you know, it's not something you want to do one time and then move on. You know, it's an ongoing, um, like a pulse check on that, on that process. And then you can also update that to make sure, is, is, it, is the control that we're doing, is it still appropriate? And so, you know, that ongoing monitoring process and, and communication with those employees, really, it, cir it circles back then to creating that environment and, and letting those employees know how important that really is to the organization and to what they do for the organization. So ongoing training, it's just not one time. Correct. It's, it's on and on Correct. and on. So if, For it to be effective, that sure. you would need to do that. Sure. If... if my organization, if I had, if I, as an owner of, of a company, and I, I wouldn't know what internal control is. I thought, well, gee, you know, my, my accounting staff, they do the bank reconciliation. You know, they make the adjustments to the receivables. You know, I never see anything uh, out of the ordinary, but I really don't know what the internal control. I believe in it, but I don't know what's going on. Does your organization and your team, will you go in and, and study those internal controls and make recommendations back to me? Absolutely. And, and these are the things that the, the types of projects now that are with, as you mentioned at the beginning uh, of the session, talking a lot about the internal controls and being on the forefront of people's minds based on news stories that hit the, that hit the paper every day. You know, it's, it's just like anything else. Um, if somebody has great internal controls, you're not going to see it in the paper or on the news. It's it's always when something goes wrong and somebody takes something or they use something inappropriately. So, you know, that's always people trying to protect, business owners trying to protect what they've built, uh, governments trying to protect taxpayer dollars. Those are the type of projects that, uh, that we've started to engage in more frequently, I would say, in the last couple of years. And and one of the thing, and it's interesting because we actually just just did one of these for an organization, and I'll tell a short story. But we went in and we were we were interviewing the uh, the person in charge of the finances, and he had an assistant, and we were talking to him about what the assistant's duties were, and we had found out that well the assistant um, collects any cash, um, all the all the uh, checks that are mailed in to this assistant she opens them. Um, she posts everything to the ledgers, she prepares the deposits, she makes the deposits, and she does the bank reconciliations. 
and you know it was just the you know just the casual conversation and, and one of the staff said well it would appear that you have a, a segregation of duty issue and the gentleman looked at him and said no no that's what i pay her to do and so i mean really it, it starts with an with an understanding of where you're exposed and so that sure. that rolls back to that risk assessment again and and just not you know not seeing where what could potentially go wrong there and so those are the, those are the types of uh, those are the types of organizations that we can go into and see that process and, and hopefully provide some value to them you know you also talk whenever we talk about internal controls our minds immediately go to to fraud but also internal controls are designed and should be in place to you know prohibit mistakes mm -hmm. or catch mistakes in financial reporting yeah, and, and that's a great point because you, you are right. It, immediately you turn to fraud. But when we have these conversations, you know, specific to the one, the example I just gave, is you say, you know, you, you implement some type of segregation to that process so that you can not only protect the organization, but you're also protecting that employee. And, and, and you can assist them to where if there is an error, then it it may not be the first thing that you go to is, well, you took it. Right. Um, and if you can add some steps into that to help safeguard not only the asset, but then to you know, make sure that you're providing the appropriate uh, process and training for that employee, then you're protecting them as well. Right. Let's go in the, in the last uh, few minutes we have. Um, you use the term segregation of duties. I'm not sure exactly what that means. What does lack of segregation of duties mean? Well, the lack of would mean you don't have any segregation. Well, no kidding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, sorry. But, no, really. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> now, now, let's get, you're an auditor with a personality. This is pretty good. Uh, you know. A little, little humorous. Yeah, there we go. Get a but, picture of that face. Look how red that face yeah, is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. But you know, you know what you're looking at is if if you have a process, um, you know, from from a process start to finish, you obviously you don't want one person to have control of that entire process. You, you know, if you can insert somebody else as an oversight or some type of monitoring of that process, or that can um, alleviate that entire process by by picking up a piece of it, and you create that segregation, so you don't have one pers person responsible for that entire process, then, then really that, that's what we're looking at. Thanks. Good explanation. Yeah. So our guest today has been Zach Morris with Ray and & Associates and Director of Ray's Government Services Team located in Millersburg, Ohio, Holmes County. That's right. And uh, if you're up that way, stop in and see Zach. He'd love to see you. Thanks again for joining us on Unsuitable today. Thanks for having me. It's clear to see why establishing and maintaining internal controls is so important. Listeners, if you want to learn more about creating the appropriate environment of internal controls, risk assessment, or staff training and monitoring, let me know at podcast at RayCPA. In the meantime, check out our website at RayCPA.com for past episodes of the podcast, articles, video, and more. And don't forget to subscribe to Unsuitable on iTunes or check out video from today's episode on Ray's YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Dave Kane, encouraging you to loosen up your tie and think outside the box. You're an ass. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was awesome.